This narrative unfolds as a poignant biography of my own life, particularly marking a significant moment that I like to call D-Day, the day I unearthed some startling truths about my existence. This revelation occurred approximately a year and a half ago, and as I reflect on it, I recognize the complexity of my feelings surrounding fatherhood. While many people often extol the joys of raising daughters, my experience has been markedly different, especially with my first daughter. From the outset, she was a source of considerable stress and challenge, a personality so strong that it felt like she was the catalyst that caused everything in our family dynamic to unravel. In many ways, her behavior acted like the first domino in a precarious line, toppling the stability we once enjoyed. My relationship with my wife has also been strained under the weight of parenting challenges, particularly as we navigated the difficulties that arose with our first child. I can honestly say that I dreaded the moment she was born, fearing the upheaval she might bring. The contrast between my first daughter and my second is stark and striking. My second daughter truly embodies the characteristics of an angel, she is the antithesis of her sister in terms of temperament and behavior. To put this in perspective, allow me to share some background information about myself that informs my current situation. I am currently 45 years old, while my wife is 42. As an ordinary individual in the Midwest, I earn a living working for a delivery service, a job that sustains us but does not offer the luxury of extravagance. My annual income hovers around $85,000, which allows us to avoid the struggles of living paycheck to paycheck, yet I wouldn't necessarily categorize our financial situation as comfortable. In contrast, my wife operates her own local business, which consists of an event cleaning and catering service. Depending on her client load, she typically brings in between $55,000 and $70,000 annually. However, her financial contributions primarily go toward groceries, as the burden of most major expenses typically falls squarely on my shoulders. While it might seem that we should be living comfortably, the reality is complicated by my wife's consumer habits and the tuition fees for my youngest daughter's boarding school. Our family includes my two daughters, aged 21 and 19, and it is my eldest, the 21-year-old, who has been the source of considerable distress throughout my life. From her early teenage years, she exhibited a proclivity for trouble that kept my wife and me on constant alert. For instance, when she was just 13, we received a shocking call from the principal informing us that she had been involved in a fight at school. The altercation resulted in her injuring another girl, which led to an unexpected financial burden of $5,000 for medical expenses, primarily because she had instigated the confrontation. The root of the fight stemmed from her claim that the other girl had stolen her boyfriend, a situation I found bewildering considering the tender age of 13 when I was still grappling with the complexities of adolescence myself. As the youngest of five brothers, I was predominantly raised by my father and siblings, having lost my mother during childbirth. My upbringing instilled in me a traditional work ethic, deeply rooted in a blue-collar perspective. College was always an option, but in my local area, the predominant employment opportunities were with a large corporation known as Caterpillar, where my father dedicated an impressive 55 years of his life, and all my brothers followed suit. Unfortunately, the landscape of job security began to shift dramatically during the Clinton administration, as trade agreements led to a significant number of jobs being outsourced to countries like China. This influx of outsourcing caused many companies to relocate to escape union regulations, leaving my community and others in a state of flux. At 25 years old, I was still riding the wave of union employment, earning nearly $100,000 a year, and had managed to marry and purchase a home outright. However, my circumstances shifted dramatically when I was laid off. Although I secured a new position in the delivery industry, it offered significantly less financial stability than my previous union job. In hindsight, I recognize that I should have pursued a college education that might have opened doors for me elsewhere in the country, allowing for greater job security in an increasingly unstable market. I waited too long to seek new opportunities and ultimately felt as though I missed my chance to improve my circumstances. The absence of role models who had traversed the path of higher education compounded my feelings of being stuck. Reflecting on my personal choices, I married the first woman with whom I felt a connection. In retrospect, this choice lacked the depth of understanding that it should have held, I failed to thoroughly investigate my wife's background or her past relationships, which might have offered insights into my daughter's challenging behavior. The old adage rings true, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Furthermore, my limited experience with women, my wife being the only one I've been with, has left me grappling with the nuances of female relationships and dynamics in our household. The complexities of my life and family interactions have shaped my experiences and understanding of fatherhood, painting a nuanced portrait that reflects the struggles and revelations of my journey. 
I vividly recall a particularly challenging moment in my life when my eldest daughter was just 14 years old. It was a day that started like any other until the principal of her school called my wife and me to come in urgently to retrieve our daughter. She had found herself entangled in trouble once again. My work schedule was demanding, consisting of 12-hour shifts five days a week, which meant I was unable to leave work until 4 p.m. By the time I managed to leave, it took me an additional half hour to reach the school, ensuring that I arrived later than I had intended. My wife, being proactive, had reached the school ahead of me, as she was able to leave her commitments earlier. Upon arriving, I discovered that our daughter had been detained by the school police for smoking with a group of boys on campus. It was a situation we never expected to find ourselves in, especially considering the values we had instilled in her. As we began to piece together the circumstances, we learned that she had been sneaking around and associating with peers who were known for their reckless behavior, including those who sold cigarettes. My initial response was rooted in disappointment and frustration. I decided to ground her, confiscate her cell phone for an entire month, and cut off her allowance for three months, believing these measures would instill a sense of accountability and responsibility in her. Unfortunately, my disciplinary actions did little to curb her behavior, as we received another call from the school not long after, marking the third instance of troubling behavior. At this point, my emotional state was a mix of devastation and embarrassment. The principal struggled to find the right words to explain the situation to us, clearly feeling a sense of sorrow about what had transpired. My heart sank as I learned that my daughter had engaged in extremely inappropriate conduct in the school bathroom reportedly giving oral sexual favors to multiple male students in exchange for money. This shocking revelation left me speechless, and I felt my world momentarily collapse around me. In the principal's office, after hearing those words, my mind went blank. I was unable to process the full extent of what I had just heard, the principal's voice faded into the background as I struggled to comprehend the horrifying reality of my daughter's actions. The image of her innocence slipping away from me was overwhelming. A deep sense of loss overwhelmed my thoughts, and I found myself spiraling into a state of anger and confusion. My upbringing had been steeped in male influence, leading me to instinctively react with a sense of harsh discipline. In a moment of raw frustration, I resorted to slapping her a few times, though I was acutely aware that I was straying too far from my role as a father. Once we returned home, the tension escalated as my wife intervened, leading to an intense argument that culminated in them leaving the house to stay with a relative for two days. In hindsight, I realized that my approach was misguided and not reflective of the support and understanding I should have extended to my daughter during such a tumultuous time. However, I also recognized that any father faced with a similar situation might have reacted with similar emotions and impulses. Following this incident, I took the time for introspection, questioning whether my actions had contributed to my daughter's troubling behavior. We had provided her with love and care throughout her upbringing, and I began to reflect on my own childhood experiences where I was never rebellious or engaged in reckless activities. I had grown up in a nurturing environment with my single father and brothers, and I was often eager to help out around the house without needing to be asked. However, I now understood that I had not fully explored my wife's background to comprehend any potential factors that may have contributed to my daughter's behavior. Eventually, I allowed my daughter and wife to return home, and we established some ground rules in an effort to regain stability. Unfortunately, by this point, the damage had been done. The news of my daughter's actions had spread like wildfire among the students, and many were aware of the incident. Reports indicated that she had engaged in sexual activities with nine boys in the bathroom, and rumors circulated rapidly, bolstered by students who captured the events on their phones, disseminating videos throughout the school. The situation escalated to the point where parents began to hear about it as well. The school administration was desperate to suppress the unfolding story to prevent it from making headlines, understanding the potential embarrassment it would bring to their institution. In an effort to manage the fallout, they chose not to officially suspend my daughter or impose any consequences, hoping to minimize the story's impact and protect their reputation. They did, however, take steps to punish those who circulated the videos, attempting to regain some measure of control over the situation. As a consequence of the incident, I found myself branded as the dad of the girl involved in inappropriate activities in the bathroom. This label was both embarrassing and frustrating for me, transforming my life as the quiet and friendly neighbor and the hard-working delivery guy into something I never expected. To complicate matters further, my youngest daughter witnessed the turmoil surrounding her sister. My wife and I were acutely aware of the need to shield our youngest from any negative influence that could arise from the chaotic atmosphere created by her older sister's choices. 
Teenage girls are particularly impressionable, and their relationships with older siblings can significantly influence their behavior and development. During a critical phase of my life, I believed that enhancing my financial situation was essential to provide my youngest daughter with an opportunity for a better future, specifically by sending her to a Catholic boarding school in another state. This decision prompted me to put in extra hours at work, striving to bridge the financial gap necessary to make this investment in her education. Looking back, I can confidently say that sending my youngest daughter to that school turned out to be one of the most worthwhile investments I have ever made. However, I found myself in a challenging position concerning my oldest daughter. At that time, I held a firm belief that she was beyond redemption, regrettably, our financial circumstances did not allow us to afford sending her to the same prestigious institution. It is understandable to reflect on my mindset during that time. I convinced myself that I had seen the worst of the situation when I learned about her actions at the age of 15, actions that included engaging in sexual activities with nine classmates. I feared that anything worse than that would be inconceivable, however, I was blissfully unaware that her journey was only beginning. My upbringing instilled in me a strong awareness of the consequences of my actions, prompting me to consider how my decisions would affect others around me. This thoughtful approach was not a product of formal education, it was simply an intrinsic part of my character. In contrast, my wife displays a more spontaneous nature. She often reacts without pause, speaks impulsively, and later reflects on her actions with regret, a behavioral pattern that resonates with some of the impulsive choices made by our daughter. The consequences of this impulsiveness have not only strained my wife's relationships but have also led to numerous conflicts, placing me in the role of peacemaker more times than I can count. I recall multiple occasions where disagreements erupted over trivial matters, resulting in arguments that truly should not have occurred. For instance, I ceased attending baseball games with her or participating in family outings that involved large groups due to the perpetual stress her behavior created. One particular memory stands out from a baseball game experience where my wife attempted to cut in line ahead of another couple. I felt compelled to remind her that we needed to adhere to the same rules that applied to everyone else, emphasizing that no one was above these guidelines. Unfortunately, my cautionary advice went unheeded, my wife's attempt to bypass the couple led to an escalation that turned into a shoving match. When the husband of the woman pushed her, I instinctively stepped in to defend her honor, despite having previously warned her about the potential consequences of her actions. This scenario spiraled into a chaotic altercation, with punches thrown and bottles shattered, leading to a public brawl that was uncharacteristic of my demeanor. The police intervened, and I narrowly avoided arrest due to my connections with several officers in that town, many of whom I had known from volunteering with the fire department or from my school days. While this chaos occurred in my thirties, similar incidents had peppered our lives from time to time. It is essential to consider that our daughters were witnesses to these episodes. What struck me as peculiar was that my wife's impulsive behavior seemed to manifest predominantly in my presence. I often wondered if she would engage in these confrontations if she were not aware of my presence. Yet, every time she sensed I was near, there appeared to be a compulsion on her part to embarrass me or create scenarios that could lead to my humiliation. This unfortunate dynamic led me to limit our participation in public events, driven by the desire to avoid potential embarrassment that her actions might provoke. This behavior didn't emerge overnight, it was a continuous pattern that I had long observed. When I first met her in her late teens and early twenties, I found her wildness refreshing and exhilarating. We often engaged in daring activities and mischief together, creating thrilling memories. However, as time went on and I stepped into fatherhood, that initial excitement transitioned into fatigue. I believed that her impulsiveness was merely a phase she would eventually outgrow, but the unfortunate reality is that these patterns have persisted to this day. Additionally, there have been numerous instances when my wife accused me of being unfaithful, often sparked by the mere act of glancing in the direction of an attractive woman. Such accusations frequently led to heated, emotional arguments between us. The reality of my work schedule, which includes 12-hour shifts, left little room for infidelity, even if I had any inclination toward it. Nevertheless, her persistent suspicions created a strain on our relationship, further complicating our interactions. Later, I came to the unsettling realization that my wife had accused me of infidelity, not out of genuine concern, but as a calculated diversion to shift the focus away from her own behavior. It's often said that when one points a finger at another, three fingers point back at themselves. This notion became increasingly relevant as I began to uncover her compulsive shopping habits that went far beyond mere indulgence. Like many people, everyone has their vices, and while some succumb to overeating or substance abuse, her vice manifested in an incessant need to shop. 
She seemed to be perpetually chasing validation and approval, a pursuit that appeared particularly shallow given her age. This obsession prompted her to take extreme measures to maintain a certain image, often going to great lengths to avoid gaining weight. Her fixation on acquiring new outfits became an almost daily ritual. It wasn't merely about clothing, it was about the fleeting boost to her self-esteem that came with each purchase. To her, wearing a brand new outfit was more than just a pleasure, it was an obsession that dictated her spending habits. Strangely, despite this constant influx of new clothes, she did not contribute her earnings to our household expenses. In fact, I rarely saw her paycheck until the end of the year, which led me to wonder about the financial dynamics of our family. If she had shared the financial responsibility, we could have improved our circumstances enough to afford sending both our daughters to a quality boarding school and significantly enhancing our quality of life. Reflecting on the turmoil surrounding our eldest daughter's turbulent experience at school, I recognized my failure to be more vigilant. The relentless teasing from her peers pushed her to the point of skipping classes, leading her to lie about attending school while associating with a questionable crowd. I thought everything was proceeding smoothly, especially since my wife was seemingly disengaged from financial responsibilities. In my effort to provide for the family, I found myself working longer hours, taking on the financial burden of our second daughter's private boarding school alone. I relied on my wife to guide our eldest daughter, ensuring she attended school and maintained good grades. As time passed, two significant events transpired. I stopped receiving updates from my daughter's school, and her bond with my wife deepened to a point where they seemed more like best friends than a mother-daughter duo. Initially, I found this closeness concerning and even unhealthy, yet since I hadn't heard of any serious issues from either my daughter's school or my wife, I mistakenly assumed that everything was under control. My wife had not expressed any worries, so I believed my daughter was progressing positively in her life. Then came an unsettling afternoon when I arrived home early, feeling unwell. As I approached my house, I noticed a tall, skinny young man, likely in his early twenties, standing on my lawn. He introduced himself as a friend of my daughter, claiming that he was simply dropping her off to pick something up and was waiting for her return to give her a ride. Trusting my instincts, I assured him that I would take care of it and that my daughter would be fine. His presence left me with an unsettling feeling, especially since my wife's work van was parked in the driveway, indicating that she was home. After he left, I immediately re-entered the house, anxious about the situation. Just as I did, my daughter rushed out, appearing hurried and somewhat flustered. I questioned her about the young man, and she insisted that he was just a friend. When I pointed out that he didn't look like a high school student, she replied that he had already graduated. This revelation raised a red flag for me, and I pressed further, inquiring why she was spending time with someone who was not enrolled in her school and why she wasn't in class at that moment. Her excuse that her class was cancelled felt suspicious, and I couldn't shake the feeling that she was being dishonest. Despite my hopes that my daughter had improved over the past two years, her current behavior suggested that things might have deteriorated instead. It became increasingly evident to me that my daughter was not only skipping school but also associating with a young man who appeared to be involved in activities I would rather not contemplate. This realization confirmed my growing suspicion that my daughter was spiraling out of control. With my wife's van still in the driveway, I figured she might have insights regarding my daughter's situation, given their newfound closeness. Entering the house, I called for my wife, but there was no response. Instead, I heard strange noises coming from the basement. Upon descending the stairs, I found her on her way out, and it was impossible not to notice the unmistakable smell of marijuana on her breath, which emanated strongly from the basement. I was taken aback and inquired about her whereabouts, explaining that I had come home feeling unwell. I also asked if she was aware that our daughter had been dropped off by a stranger and had been lying about her cancelled class. I hesitated, thinking the news might shock her, yet I was met with an unexpectedly dismissive attitude. She asserted that the young man outside was a friend of our daughter's, claiming he had come to retrieve something. I was taken aback by this revelation, disbelief coursed through me as I firmly stated that I never wanted to encounter that man again. I instructed her to ensure that our daughter ceased any further interaction with him. Overwhelmed by a sense of unease, I decided to truncate the argument, even though a multitude of questions lingered in my mind. I informed my daughter that her mother would be the one to take her to school the following day and then retreated to bed to find some semblance of rest. That day was exhausting, and while I eventually fell asleep, I awoke later that night, still haunted by the earlier exchange. The unsettling incident preoccupied my thoughts, overshadowing everything else. 
As I surfaced from slumber, feeling somewhat rejuvenated and with a clearer mindset, various pieces of the puzzle began to fit together. I recalled seeing a man who resembled someone who might be involved in illicit activities lingering on my front lawn. Furthermore, the unmistakable odor of marijuana wafted from the basement, a space where my wife had frequently spent her time. It dawned on me that she must have noticed the odor as well. Additionally, I couldn't help but ponder the growing closeness between my daughter and her mother. Through this deductive reasoning, the alarming possibility occurred to me, my wife could potentially be entangled in this situation. It was conceivable that she might be using marijuana with our daughter, and that the man on our lawn could be supplying them. Although my wife has never been a smoker, she has an inclination to align herself with the younger crowd, often striving to embody the persona of a cool mom. Her immaturity makes it plausible that she would engage in such behavior, ignoring the potential fallout of her actions. With suspicions mounting regarding my wife's possible involvement in smoking with our daughter or, at the very least, covering for her, my faith in her ability to serve as a positive role model began to erode. This realization prompted me to take decisive action, I scheduled an appointment with the school's principal to discuss my daughter's attendance and academic performance without my wife's knowledge. The following morning, I made a call to the principal's office and secured a meeting for noon. During our conversation, I was alarmed to learn that my daughter had been frequently absent from class, and the school had been sending notices to our home regarding her attendance issues. It became evident she had not completed her core academic courses, placing her at risk of not graduating on time due to her dismal grades. This confirmation of my suspicions intensified my concern about how my daughter was choosing to spend her time outside of school. Memories of her past behaviors resurfaced, leading me to worry that she had reverted to old habits, potentially socializing with boys like the one I had seen on my front lawn. At this juncture, the most pressing question that plagued my mind was how much my wife was aware of these troubling developments. If she was aware and choosing to cover for our daughter, it would indicate a severe lack of control and a blatant sabotage of my efforts to ensure our daughter's well-being. In retrospect, I found myself reflecting on my role in this unfolding situation. When businesses began relocating from our area to southern states or countries like Mexico and China, property values plummeted. Many of my friends made the decision to leave, migrating to states like Florida, Texas, and Arizona. However, I opted to stay, a choice I now regret. The value of my home has declined by nearly 50%, and the neighborhood has undergone a significant transformation, it is no longer the same. The quality of the local schools has deteriorated over time, contributing to a sense of despair regarding our community's future. This decline has left me feeling like I fell victim to a slow, unrecognizable change, too complacent to realize that a move to a better area was necessary. I often question whether my daughter would have turned out differently had we relocated, certainly, it would have been more challenging for her to encounter negative influences in a more reputable school district. Upon arriving home that evening, I confronted my wife about our daughter's troubling school attendance. She appeared genuinely astonished, vehemently claiming that she had no idea our daughter had been skipping classes. She stated that she had not received any communication from the school and assumed everything was progressing smoothly. I then brought up the scent of marijuana I had noticed when she emerged from the basement the previous day. My wife insisted that it was our daughter who had been using it, asserting that she had caught her drinking and smoking previously. Despite our daughter's earlier promise to refrain from drinking, my wife maintained that while she did not approve of our daughter smoking, she felt ill-equipped to manage the situation. She harbored a deep concern about pushing her daughter away, fearing that excessive strictness would only drive her to seek solace in the company of boys, potentially leading her down a dangerous path. The thought of losing her daughter was unbearable, she wanted to maintain a connection while still attempting to guide her. In contrast, the husband believed that his wife's open-minded approach was misguided. He was convinced that his daughter's use of marijuana was a significant issue, one that needed to be addressed decisively. After expressing his concerns to his wife, he made it clear that he would not sit idly by while his daughter jeopardized her future under their roof. This was particularly alarming given the prevalence of marijuana enthusiasts in their town, and he had no intention of allowing his daughter to become one of them. To take action, he reached out to a friend who worked at the sheriff's department, seeking assistance in conveying the gravity of the situation to his daughter. The following day, he took a day off from work, intending to make a strong statement by taking his daughter to the police station. His plan was to have the sheriff illustrate the potential consequences of her reckless behavior, hoping it would serve as a wake-up call. He envisioned that a scared straight scenario where the sheriff would introduce her to women who had experienced the harsh realities of life behind bars due to poor choices. 
After the meeting with the sheriff was over, he expressed his heartfelt gratitude for the help. The sheriff, concerned about the issues at hand, inquired about the individual who had been supplying his daughter with marijuana. The father provided the name and license plate of the man in question, and the sheriff assured him that he would take appropriate action. They left the station, but unbeknownst to him, his daughter had already been two months pregnant at that point. His wife informed him of this revelation on the same day she discovered it, explaining that their daughter was exhibiting symptoms that suggested her condition. Initially, he reacted with a knee-jerk suggestion that an abortion should be considered. He felt overwhelmed and placed the blame squarely on his wife, accusing her of being more of a friend to their daughter than a guiding mother. The situation filled him with embarrassment, and he was desperate to resolve it swiftly. However, his wife had a different perspective and wanted to keep the baby, advocating for their daughter's right to make her own choices. Tensions escalated as the husband insisted that their daughter's life would not follow the troubling paths he had seen portrayed on television. He firmly believed that the stakes were too high to allow for leniency. Despite his insistence, his wife remained steadfast in her viewpoint, leading to a strained relationship with their daughter. He expressed his disappointment vehemently, raising his voice and using harsh words in an attempt to make her grasp the seriousness of her situation. Unfortunately, he misjudged her understanding, she seemed unresponsive to his concerns. The very next day, she disappeared from home, taking most of her belongings with her, effectively running away. His wife, feeling the weight of the situation, pointed fingers at him for his harsh approach, and they were both overwhelmed by the stress that had built up. He returned to work to explain everything to his supervisor, seeking time off to search for their daughter. Fortunately, the supervisor was sympathetic and granted him two weeks of unpaid leave. For the next two days, he and his wife scoured the area for any sign of their daughter, primarily focusing on the marijuana dealer, whose influence he believed was responsible for her pregnancy. Unfortunately, they came up empty-handed, even after checking known addresses and reaching out to the dealer's family members. They soon learned that he might have fled to another state, leaving them with little hope of finding him or their daughter. On the third day of their search, their daughter reached out to her mother. She reassured her that she was doing fine but expressed her refusal to talk to her father, fully aware of the anger he directed toward her. She suggested that they cease their search, which shook him to his core. Accepting that he might have lost his daughter felt insurmountable. His desire to change her was fading, and he decided to redirect his focus toward his other daughter, who appeared to have a bright future ahead. She excelled academically, reflected his personality, and seemed to tick all the right boxes. Yet, despite his attempts to move forward, not a day passed without thoughts of his estranged daughter clouding his mind. Five months later, they learned that she had given birth to a baby girl. His wife and younger daughter made the trip to visit her in another state, but he struggled to join them. Upon their return, they painted a grim picture of the living conditions his daughter and her boyfriend were enduring. It became evident that her choice of partner was disastrous, he was failing even as a marijuana seller. The realization that his daughter had made such poor decisions was painful, and he couldn't shake the feeling of disappointment and worry that had become his constant companions. Three months prior to the birth of my daughter's child, she made an earnest attempt to reconnect with me. It became increasingly clear to her that living as a runaway bride, combined with the struggles of being involved with a man who was failing in his career, was not the idyllic existence she had envisioned. Despite her outreach, I chose to remain distant and unresponsive. During a visit, my wife returned home with a letter from our daughter, which I opened with curiosity. In her letter, she expressed a heartfelt apology, indicating that she had finally come to terms with the truths I had been trying to convey to her all along. She voiced her regret over her decision to distance herself from me and acknowledged that her actions had led to significant consequences. Despite her intentions to make me proud, she candidly admitted that she frequently found herself in troublesome situations. As I later discovered, her boyfriend had a turbulent history, marked by repeated incarcerations related to drug charges, specifically involving pills. His inability to maintain steady employment further complicated their circumstances, as they struggled to support themselves and their newly born child. My wife, with good intentions, had been sending them financial help, which allowed them to sustain a transient lifestyle, moving from one motel to another. This situation persisted during the holiday season when my daughter returned home with her baby for a visit. During this time, we were able to reconcile somewhat, and I welcomed the baby into our home. However, when my daughter expressed her desire to stay with us after Christmas, I stood firm in my decision to not allow that. At the age of 19, she was legally an adult, and I believed it was crucial for her to carve out a life separate from mine. 
The sense of relief I felt came from knowing that she was no longer my responsibility, as I had no intention of allowing her boyfriend to have any presence in my household, regardless of the fact that he was now the father of my grandchild. My daughter was free to visit during holidays, but it was clear to me that I would not be providing her with any financial support. My wife, however, had a very different outlook on the situation. She longed for her daughter to stay at home with us and nurture her child, and she worked diligently to persuade me otherwise. Our disagreements escalated into significant tensions, leading to my wife giving me the silent treatment and withholding intimacy for several months. Regardless of the conflict, I remained resolute, believing that my daughter needed to establish her own independence. I encouraged her to return to her previous life and remain there. Unexpectedly, in February, my daughter and her boyfriend moved back into town. True to my concerns, he was soon arrested due to an outstanding warrant, leading to a seven-month prison sentence. During his incarceration, my daughter and her baby began visiting our home more frequently. Their presence quietly transitioned from occasional visits to something more permanent, as they gradually moved in without any formal announcement. I discovered a growing fondness for my granddaughter, whose cheerful demeanor brought a sense of warmth to our home, much to the delight of both my wife and my daughter. My daughter found employment working for my wife alongside two other employees, and it appeared that they were thriving in this new arrangement. Fast forward approximately five months, I learned that the boyfriend had been released from prison earlier than expected. Concerned about the implications of his release, I had a candid discussion with my daughter, making it unmistakably clear that she was free to move in with him but that I did not want him around my house. I expressed my stance with the hope that both my wife and my daughter would comprehend the seriousness of my position. For a time, I didn't see him in my home, not at least when I was not there. However, one evening, as my wife and I were preparing for bed, she informed me that he had reached out to her, asking if she could provide him with employment. At that time, my wife had three employees, including our daughter, and her business was flourishing. She believed that it would be beneficial to hire him as an additional worker, arguing that he struggled to find employment elsewhere due to his criminal background. Furthermore, she mentioned that he was no longer using pills and was subject to regular drug testing as part of his probation requirements. While I acknowledged my wife's perspective and recognized his efforts to reform his life, I firmly insisted that such personal transformations should take place outside of our home. I was adamant that he had already inflicted enough damage upon my daughter, and I was determined to protect my family from any further harm. Our conversation concluded without resolution, and about a week later, to my dismay, I returned home from work to find him at my house. He was in the process of assisting my wife and daughter in unloading items from their work van, a situation that caught me off guard. It soon became evident that my wife had been employing him without my prior knowledge. Confronting him, I demanded that he leave my property immediately, making it clear that I would not tolerate his presence any longer. On a particularly disheartening day, my wife and daughter remained silent, fully aware of the deep frustration and anger that coursed through me. The events leading up to that moment had pushed me to the brink, to the point where I seriously contemplated asking my daughter to leave our home. She had attempted to defend her actions by explaining that she had explicitly told him to keep his distance. However, the real issue lay in my wife's decision to allow him to assist her, which only intensified the atmosphere in the house that evening. The peace that typically enveloped our home was shattered, replaced by an underlying tension that made it unbearable. In my rage, I issued a threat to my daughter, making it clear that if that man ever stepped foot in our home again, I would not hesitate to ask her to leave. My wife was not in agreement with my reaction, insisting that I was overreacting to the situation. I pressed my daughter, pointing out that she was earning money and was capable of finding her own place to live. In moments of frustration, I even suggested that she should consider moving in with him. Her response was measured, revealing that she was indeed saving her money and did not want to live with him until he secured a stable job. There was a layer of concern embedded in her words as she mentioned that if my wife continued to hire him, he might spiral back into drug use and potentially face dire consequences. Although I kept my thoughts to myself, I began to wonder whether his imprisonment might be a fitting solution to the problems he posed for our family. A nagging suspicion grew within me, suggesting that he might never find a way to turn his life around and would continue to cling to my family despite the damage he had already done. After that day, he disappeared from our lives for two to three months, but during that time, I started to notice a faint, yet persistent smell of marijuana permeating our home, particularly in the basement. I hesitated to confront my wife or daughter, I feared their reactions and the potential for further deceit. Instead of initiating a potentially explosive conversation, I opted for a more discreet approach. I purchased a motion-activated security camera, 
cleverly disguised as a wall clock, which I strategically placed in the basement. This camera boasted 128 gigabytes of storage, allowing it to record up to 96 hours of continuous footage. It was connected to my Wi-Fi and could send alerts to my phone. However, given my demanding work schedule, I realized I would not have the time to constantly monitor it. To cover my bases, I bought a second camera, giving me the capacity to record motion-activated footage for up to two weeks. My plan was to review the recordings all at once after the two-week period. On a Saturday afternoon, I settled down in my home office, ready to sift through the footage. The first day's recordings depicted ordinary family life, my wife and daughter were frequently seen accessing the basement, where we stored various equipment and items, including my wife's private office. There was nothing that raised suspicion at that point. However, as I moved to the second day of footage, my heart sank. The camera captured my wife, and then, shockingly, my daughter's boyfriend appeared in the frame. I watched in disbelief as he approached my wife from behind, kissing her neck and engaging in intimate actions that were incredibly unsettling. My mind raced, and I rubbed my eyes in an attempt to shake off what I was seeing. Yet, despite my desperate hope, there was no mistaking it, it was indeed my wife. They continued this inappropriate encounter for approximately 20 minutes, their actions disturbingly casual, resembling scenes I had witnessed in explicit films. The realization that this could have been an ongoing affair crushed me. In my fury, I hastily skimmed through the video, desperate to find more evidence of their clandestine meetings. On yet another day, they entered the basement appearing affectionate, and I was faced with the painful sight of them engaging in intimacy that I very rarely experienced with my wife. Their confidence in not being caught was evident, they even took time to relax and smoke together afterwards, seemingly unconcerned about the possibility of discovery. Over the course of the recordings, they engaged in these activities at least three times a week, a stark contrast to the single intimate moment I shared with my wife weekly. The depth of my bewilderment was profound, I never anticipated such betrayal from my wife, especially with someone I had strong aversions toward. I had suspected my wife might indulge in marijuana with our daughter, but I never fathomed she would take it further by cheating with him. The thought of her willingness to destroy our family for this man, particularly knowing the turmoil it would bring upon us, was incomprehensible. It raised troubling questions about her character and loyalty. I was left wrestling with the unsettling realization that if she could betray me in such a way with this individual, what else could she be concealing about her life and relationships? The betrayal dug deeper than mere infidelity, it forced me to reconsider everything I thought I understood about my marriage and my wife's commitments. At this moment, I was engulfed by a profound sense of betrayal, leading me to believe that my entire marriage and life had been a farce. All the effort I had dedicated to building our family felt utterly pointless, devoid of any meaningful outcome. As I reflected on the situation, I started to observe a disturbing pattern regarding my wife's intimate moments with her boyfriend, which seemed to align perfectly with the times when my daughter and her boyfriend were at work. This timing suggested a premeditated plan for private encounters, further fueling the pent-up rage I felt toward the man who had invaded our lives. In the midst of this turmoil, my first instinct was to contact my daughter, who was downstairs at the time. I played her the recording I had discovered, and she listened with an expression of shock that mirrored my own. As we processed the reality of the situation together, she revealed troubling information about her mother. My daughter disclosed that her mother had begun supplying her with marijuana when she was in high school, even providing her with money to procure it herself. This initiated a pathway of addiction that ultimately drew my wife closer to her boyfriend, as they found common ground through their shared dependency. Despite their closeness, my daughter had never suspected an affair between them. She maintained that she recognized their bond but believed her mother was simply trying to shield her from potential harm by keeping this relationship under wraps. Thankfully, my daughter provided me with the contact information for her mother's probation officer. Armed with the recording of the boyfriend smoking, I sent it to him, hoping it would trigger a drug test that would reveal the extent of his violations. The conversation with my daughter filled in several gaps in my understanding, particularly concerning how my wife managed to hide her sporadic attendance issues and the timeline of when their friendship had transformed into something more sinister. My wife was proficient in the art of deception, skillfully obscuring her own issues while portraying my daughter as the primary problem in our family. Her reckless behavior had not only jeopardized her life but also led to the destruction of her daughter's well-being. I found myself consumed by anger, a relentless desire to rid my life of this man who had disrupted everything. I turned to a law enforcement friend for guidance. Unsolicited, he chose to drive past my home, wanting to be present when I confronted my wife. 
Though I attempted to encourage him to leave, he remained insistent, expressing concern for my emotional state and the potential consequences of my actions. When I confronted my wife, her reaction was one of avoidance. She offered no denial of the accusations I laid before her, likely because the evidence was irrefutable. Fearful of the implications, she refrained from revealing when her infidelity had commenced. That day marked a low point for me, I took swift action and discarded her belongings from our home, a move that left me shattered. The devastation was not mine alone, my daughter was equally heartbroken. It became painfully clear that my wife had meticulously orchestrated this betrayal, masquerading as a supportive partner while secretly undermining the very fabric of our family. The entirety of the situation felt surreal. The revelation of my wife's infidelity was jarring, a crushing blow that shifted my perspective on her entirely. In that moment, I viewed her actions with a level of disdain that eclipsed my feelings toward my daughter. In the aftermath, my law enforcement friend intervened, advising me against escalating my actions further, reminding me that my state of mind was volatile. I was overwhelmed with rage, feeling that no justification for my wife could change her role in this betrayal, she was the enemy in my eyes, and nothing could amend the hurt she had caused. As the days passed, my initial fury morphed into restless energy and a yearning for retribution. This restlessness was a consequence of my insatiable need to understand precisely when this deceit had begun. The desire for revenge was directed not only at my wife but also at my daughter's boyfriend, who I held responsible for the disintegration of our family unit. After submitting the incriminating video to the probation officer, my sheriff friend assured me that he would advocate for a swift response from the probation office regarding the boyfriend's violations, which were serious, given that he was already on probation for drug-related offenses. In the three days following my decision to kick my wife out of our home, she had made numerous attempts to reach me, all of which I ignored after blocking her number. Instead, she sought the assistance of my oldest daughter, who remained at the house, using her as a messenger to relay communication. Initially, my oldest daughter was upset over her mother's betrayal, but I soon discovered that her emotional response had shifted to indifference. I speculated that this change was possibly due to her financial dependence on my wife, who had been her primary source of income. I held deep reservations about my daughter potentially forgiving her mother merely out of necessity, as I wanted her to find peace and closure in this turbulent situation without any strings attached to her decision. I wanted to create an environment where my daughter could express her thoughts and feelings candidly without the looming anxiety of potential repercussions. This was essential for me to truly understand the situation she was in and to uncover the underlying factors affecting her life. I recognized that my support was crucial, especially as she navigated the challenging realities of young motherhood. My wife, however, was a destructive force in this dynamic. She manipulated our daughter into purchasing substances for her own benefit, all while projecting the blame onto our daughter. It became increasingly evident that my primary goal was to liberate my daughter from her mother's toxic influence. Despite the various struggles my daughter faced as a young mother, I firmly believed that she had the potential to forge a successful path independent of her mother's negativity. Later that evening, after work, I sat down with my daughter to encourage her to share more about her experiences. She recounted how her troubles began when she was just 14 years old and got caught smoking. Despite her attempts to convince both me and my wife that she had quit, the truth was that she continued to indulge in it secretly. The situation escalated when one day, her mother found some marijuana in our daughter's room during a cleaning session. My daughter pleaded with her mother not to inform me, and though she kept that promise, she nonetheless retained the stash without disposing of it. My daughter grew increasingly suspicious that her mother was invading her privacy, as she often noticed that her belongings had been moved around without explanation. In response to my daughter's misbehavior at school, my wife took a concerned approach, wanting to address the issue at hand. However, her method differed significantly from mine, she was more open and lacked the judgmental tone that often characterized my responses. During our conversation, my daughter admitted that she was harboring resentment towards both of us and had resorted to desperate measures to secure money for marijuana. In what I perceived as a misguided attempt to help, my wife decided that the solution was to provide our daughter with money for the substance instead of allowing her to resort to risky actions to obtain it. This was something I was unaware of at the time, which only complicated matters further. Things took a turn when my wife caught our daughter smoking in the backyard one afternoon. Instead of reprimanding her, my wife shockingly chose to join her. They smoked two blunts together that day, marking the onset of my wife's own addiction. As time went on, they began to smoke whenever I was not around, carefully concealing any evidence of their actions from me. It was during this period that my daughter's bond with her mother intensified. 
My daughter confided in me that she was now receiving marijuana from her boyfriend, who ensured she was never without it. It was clear he had romantic intentions, but my daughter was more interested in using him for pills, showing her disinterest in a serious relationship at that stage. Ironically, it seemed that my wife was consuming most of the marijuana that her daughter's boyfriend supplied. Initially, she had no romantic interest in him but chose to keep him around for her benefit, simultaneously taking money from her mother while receiving free marijuana from him. Everything shifted dramatically when her boyfriend came over one day to drop off some marijuana. My wife introduced herself to him, a moment that surprised my daughter, who was only about 16 at the time while he was significantly older, being roughly six years her senior. They quickly formed a connection, spending time together in the basement under the pretense of socializing while smoking. My daughter, feeling increasingly sidelined, left the house for about three hours to meet with friends. When she returned, she found her mother and her boyfriend still in the basement. However, he decided to leave as soon as she came back. Following that encounter, he began inventing reasons to visit our home more frequently, and I even caught him loitering on our lawn at one point. Eventually, my daughter and he entered into a romantic relationship, and it wasn't long before she became pregnant. Initially, my daughter expressed a strong desire to have an abortion, a choice I supported and encouraged her to proceed with. However, my wife manipulated the situation and convinced her otherwise. Threats from her boyfriend complicated matters further, he warned her against terminating the pregnancy, instilling fear and desperation in her. Recognizing that raising a child in our household would lead to significant strife, my wife and her boyfriend orchestrated a plan for my daughter to move out of state until the baby was born. They intended for her to leave without notice. Throughout this troubling time, when my daughter was reported missing, my wife maintained communication with her and her boyfriend, all the while feigning ignorance about their whereabouts, deceiving me completely while my daughter recounted this painful narrative. I found myself grappling with an unsettling realization about my wife and her influence on our daughter during a critical period in her life. At the time, I was oblivious to the depth of the situation, but in retrospect, it seems evident that my wife was subtly undermining my efforts to guide our daughter toward positive change. I now recognize that my wife may have encouraged our daughter to engage in reckless behavior, thereby giving her tacit approval for actions that ultimately led to detrimental consequences. This realization casts our daughter in the role of a victim in this complex scenario. One of my greatest regrets is that my daughter never felt comfortable confiding in me about the truth of her struggles. Yet, as I learned more, I began to understand the reasons behind her silence. My daughter recounted that during her pregnancy, my wife made numerous secret visits to her, providing financial support without my knowledge. These covert meetings were necessitated by the troubling behavior of her boyfriend, who consistently found himself in trouble with law enforcement. This chaotic existence was exacerbated by his unfamiliarity with the area they were in. Initially, my daughter and her boyfriend had envisioned a longer stay in that other state, but their plans quickly unraveled due to his ongoing legal troubles and repeated incarcerations. After spending the first Christmas with us, my wife encouraged our daughter to relocate closer so she could regularly see her grandson. Gradually, this led to my daughter moving back into our home. Once she unveiled the layers of this situation to me, everything began to align. It became glaringly clear that my wife's duplicity was a significant factor in the difficulties I faced in forging a stronger relationship with our daughter. My wife's self-serving desires had a hand in exacerbating our daughter's problems. My daughter revealed that her tumultuous relationship with her ex-boyfriend had been heavily influenced by my wife's manipulation and pressure. Despite her feelings of care for him, she admitted she was never truly in love with him. What remained hidden from her was the fact that my wife had been involved with him on the side and had lost interest in him long before the affair came to light. This realization was deeply troubling and raised further questions about the dynamics at play between my wife and my daughter. Despite the complexities of their relationship, they continued to stay in touch, and my daughter even worked for my wife. In the following week, I arranged to meet with my wife to discuss the logistics of her belongings remaining in the house. My anger had somewhat subsided since the previous week, particularly after learning that my daughter's ex-boyfriend was in county jail with a high bail set against him. Law enforcement friends relayed that he had become a flight risk after a failed drug test, leading to his subsequent arrest. The circumstances surrounding his capture underscored the gravity of his situation. With these revelations, I sought to reconnect with my daughter, believing that much of her misconduct stemmed from my wife's influence. During the meeting with my wife, while my daughter was at home, my wife expressed deep remorse for her actions. She asked for my forgiveness and pleaded with me not to pursue a divorce. 
She attempted to explain her infidelity as a consequence of her struggles with pill addiction and the overwhelming stress of a faltering business. I found her rationale lacking in credibility, but the length of our marriage and my daughter's willingness to forgive provided me with pause for reflection. In considering these factors, I decided to give our relationship another chance, albeit with stipulations. I communicated that another lie would definitively sever our bond. Selling the house and relocating had crossed my mind as a possible solution, but I opted instead for reconciliation for the time being. A week later, signs of progress began to emerge. My wife appeared committed to making amends and was open about her activities, assuring me of her lack of contact with my daughter's ex-boyfriend, who remained incarcerated. Meanwhile, my wife and daughter were actively working to rebuild their relationship, which seemed to be flourishing alongside my wife's business, which was thriving while still operating out of our home. The shift in dynamics was evident, and a sense of cautious optimism began to replace the uncertainty that had previously clouded our lives. A few days later, I discovered that a peculiar car was trailing me during my trips from my residence to a nearby store. Initially, I dismissed it as coincidence, attributing it to the frequent occurrence of strangers on the road. However, upon returning from my shopping excursion, I observed the same vehicle once again following my path. This time, I grew more vigilant, keeping a close watch on the driver to indicate that I was aware of their presence. It was a subtle but deliberate gesture to show that I was not oblivious to the situation unfolding around me. When I finally arrived home, I took a moment to glance out of my window and, to my dismay, saw the same car slowly cruising past my house. I made a mental note of the license plate and the driver's features, feeling an unsettling sense of unease. The following morning, my worst fears were realized when I discovered that all four tires on my car had been punctured and the body had been maliciously scratched. This act of vandalism felt personal, and I promptly reported the incident to the police, detailing the suspicious vehicle that had been lurking around my home. It came as no surprise when the authorities informed me that the car turned out to be stolen. This revelation led me to suspect a potential connection between the driver and my daughter's ex-boyfriend, whether as a friend or possibly a family member. The realization that someone from that circle might be targeting me filled me with concern and dread. Given the unsettling circumstances, I decided it was time to explore job opportunities in the southern states as a means of escape from the increasingly hostile environment. I broached the topic with my boss, inquiring about any openings. He mentioned that there were positions available in Texas and Alabama, although the specifics were yet to be determined. It was clear that these roles would be lateral moves rather than promotions, but for me, the prospect of relocating felt like a necessary step. I had developed a fondness for the area and invested significant time and effort into the community, serving as a volunteer firefighter and building strong relationships with local law enforcement. Despite these attachments, the persistent changes in the community and the recent vandalism served as the final straws in my decision-making process. I felt a profound sense that the community I had once cherished had strayed far from its original spirit. Approximately two weeks after the incident that damaged my property, my daughter informed me that her ex-boyfriend had been trying to reach her. She explained that he had first attempted to call her from prison. Since she did not recognize the number, she answered out of curiosity. During the call, he revealed that he had accepted a plea deal, which meant his case would not be going to trial. The charges against him were serious, including multiple offenses related to the distribution of pills with intent to sell, theft, probation violation, resisting arrest, and a particularly grave charge of transporting restricted substances across state lines, which carried federal implications. The potential for a lengthy prison sentence loomed over him like a dark cloud. In an alarming twist, my daughter disclosed that her ex-boyfriend had shifted the blame for his circumstances onto me, harboring resentment towards my role in his life. It shocked me that he had the audacity to enter my home, threaten my family, and then attempt to cast me as the villain in his narrative. His arrogance and recklessness were astonishing, as he seemed to believe he could act without facing any consequences. I felt a sense of relief knowing he was confined and hoped that he would ultimately face a full trial, forcing him to account for the multitude of his offenses. However, my primary concern was my new grandson. I harbored fears that he might inherit his father's problematic traits. In a way, it felt harsh to think that way, yet when I looked at my grandson's innocent face, I was reminded of his father, which gave me an uncomfortable feeling of challenge as if my grandson were silently defying me in his infancy. I realized I might be tasked with raising this child, instilling in him values that would prevent him from following in the misguided footsteps of his parents. Despite my wife's recent efforts to amend our strained relationship, I struggled to rebuild trust. My doubts lingered heavily. 
In hindsight, I believed I should have chosen to divorce her, as my concerns regarding her influence on my daughter and, now, my grandson, continued to weigh on my mind. As part of our fragile reconciliation agreement, I opted to purchase an A15 panel drug test cup online, which I now used weekly to screen both my wife and my daughter. So far, the results have been acceptable, giving me a fleeting sense of peace. Fast forward approximately a month later, my daughter made the proactive decision to block calls from unfamiliar numbers, effectively shutting out any communication attempts from her ex-boyfriend's acquaintances and family. She had severed ties with her previous underground connections and was following my guidance. Our relationship saw a notable improvement, and she was evolving into the person I had always hoped she could be. It was encouraging to see her actively working towards obtaining her GED, with aspirations of re-enrolling in college to pursue her education further. In an attempt to stay informed about my daughter's ex-boyfriend situation, I reached out to friends in law enforcement. They informed me that he had been sentenced to a mandatory 15-year prison term. In that moment of clarity, I felt a wave of relief wash over me. The idea that he would spend the next 15 years behind bars opened a window of hope that perhaps this time could facilitate a transformation, enabling him to emerge as a better person when his sentence was finally served. While my initial outlook on the situation was far from positive, a conversation with a friend in law enforcement took an unexpected turn just as we were concluding our call. He extended an invitation to a bar, mentioning that an officer who worked in the cell block where my daughter's ex-boyfriend was serving time would be present. Despite my reluctance and desire to distance myself from any connections to my daughter's ex-boyfriend, I eventually reconsidered. I recognize the importance of maintaining relationships with individuals in law enforcement and other authoritative positions, a practice I had cultivated over my career. These connections have proven beneficial on numerous occasions, particularly during challenging times. On that Saturday night, I met the officer in question, a seemingly amiable individual with whom I struck up a meaningful conversation. I casually mentioned that my daughter's ex-boyfriend was incarcerated in the facility where he worked. Although the officer did not know him personally or recognize his name immediately, he made a note of it, which seemed promising at the time. Two weeks later, our paths crossed again at a law enforcement event. Given my role as a volunteer for local firefighters, I often found myself attending such community gatherings, providing an opportunity to strengthen ties within the network. During our discussion at the event, the officer disclosed some concerning information. He revealed that a woman had come to visit my daughter's ex-boyfriend for a conjugal visit. Initially, my mind raced, contemplating the possibility that it could be my daughter, especially since she shared a child with him. However, the officer clarified that the woman appeared to be significantly older than my daughter, which eased some of my immediate concerns. I inquired whether he could provide a description, and he stated that all he knew was that she was a white woman likely in her mid to late forties. He had noted her name from the check-in list but admitted he hadn't paid close attention, only noticing them holding hands before the woman left. He had been busy with other responsibilities but, in a brief moment of opportunity, glanced at the check-in list and wrote down a name, albeit uncertain if it was the right one. He assured me he would check his work locker the next day for the name and would text it to me as soon as he had access to it. Returning home that evening, a wave of unease washed over me. I felt a deep sense of dread, knowing that it was unlikely my daughter would be the one making such a visit, yet I couldn't shake the worry about who it might be. The thought of it possibly being my wife haunted me, the implications of such a revelation would be devastating. That night, sleep eluded me entirely as I anxiously awaited the officer's message. At 9 a.m. the following morning, I was on edge, anticipating news about the identity of the woman. To my shock, a message arrived at 8.30 a.m. with the name, my wife's name. By that time, I was already at work, aware that my wife and daughter were both at their respective jobs, having started their days earlier than mine. The reality began to sink in, all our recent efforts to reconcile were overshadowed by betrayal. My wife had seemingly not changed in the slightest, her actions indicated an unwavering obsession with her ex-boyfriend, as she'd gone so far as to visit him in prison. All the tears, all the heartfelt pleas for reconciliation now felt like hollow deceptions, a web of lies spun around us. In an urgent response to this revelation, I promptly reached out to a local divorce lawyer to set up an appointment for that very day. Additionally, I contacted a real estate agent to arrange a walkthrough of our house, signaling my intent to list it for sale. Understanding the importance of my career, I checked in with my boss regarding the progress of my upcoming transfer. 
He informed me that we should expect a response within two weeks and provided further details about the potential new position in Dallas, Texas, along with the likelihood of a pay increase, though it had not yet been confirmed. Next, I called my daughter, imploring her to return home early. She explained, however, that her current work commitments would not allow it, as it would disrupt her co-worker schedules. So, I made the decision to leave work early myself to make it to the lawyer's office. Much of the necessary information had already been discussed over the phone, so the meeting served primarily to finalize details and collect the divorce papers I would soon serve to my wife. Later that evening, when my wife and daughter returned home, I had the divorce papers ready and waiting. Once they were settled, I took a deep breath and addressed my daughter directly, revealing the heart-wrenching truth that her mother had been secretly visiting her ex-boyfriend in state prison and had been lying to us all along. In that moment, my wife offered no denial, confirming the reality of the situation in the most devastating way possible. She started crying, her tears pouring forth as she apologized profusely, confessing in a trembling voice that her indiscretion had occurred only once. It was at that moment, overwhelmed by a mixture of disbelief and betrayal, that I called her the name that echoed my deepest hurt, branding her as an unbelievably evil person. The weight of my emotions was immense as I handed her the divorce papers, the finality of the gesture hanging in the air between us. I informed her that she needed to start making preparations to move out because I was making the decision to sell the house and relocate to Texas. My daughter, witnessing the turmoil, immediately asked if she could accompany me on this new journey. I welcomed her request with open arms, agreeing without hesitation. In that moment, I found that I was not as angry as I had anticipated. Instead, what washed over me was a profound sense of relief. The burden of the hidden truth was finally lifted off my shoulders, and I felt a newfound freedom from what I could only describe as this wicked situation and the environment that had trapped me. The prospect of moving to Texas filled me with hope for the future, a chance to start anew in a place that seemed full of possibilities. The following day, I reached out to my youngest daughter, sharing the significant news of my impending relocation. It was important for me to keep her informed and involved in this decision, as it had ramifications for both of our lives. Shortly thereafter, my wife approached me, her demeanor noticeably different. She expressed her desire to buy the house from me, making a generous offer that exceeded the asking price. It felt as though she was trying to appease me, to make amends for the hurt caused by her actions. However, truthfully, I realized that nothing she could offer would bring me any happiness at this point. The fatigue from the emotional turmoil I had experienced weighed heavily upon me, yet I was resolute in my desire to move forward. I just wanted to be free from the ties that bound me to this home. Despite my personal feelings, I agreed to sell the house to her, I did not want to waste any more time lingering in a situation that no longer held joy or comfort for me. In that moment, she offered an apology, acknowledging her mistakes and admitting the validity of all the accusations I had made against her. She spoke candidly about her confusion regarding what had led her to make those choices, expressing a sincere commitment to seek help in hopes of finding a path toward healing. The conversation, although painful, was a necessary step in the process of moving on from the life we had shared. 